happen. Normally, the thing is this is that I'll talk, and then um, maybe we close the door. Uh, I'll talk, and then at the end of the talk, you know, people ask questions. But in the spirit of a conversation, maybe we could do is that as I talk, if there are you know, things that come up that you disagree with or want to comment on, let's do it that way. Let's have a conversation. This isn't really that formal. Um, <clears throat> the subject that I was tasked by Dave kind of unexpectedly to give is um, uh, covering, uh, what do you say, Undef un uh, undefeated sports, covering sports in an undefeated way. And um, it was kind of fascinating. Just a little bit, of, a little bio. Uh, of course, my name is Bill Roden. And uh, I've been uh, in the business uh, for pay since about 1973. Uh, uh, my first job was at, uh, I guess first thing I should say, when, I, when, when Dave was tell, asking me what to, you know, about what to talk about uh, and how do you cover race in sports. And uh, it kind of threw me. I've been thinking about it for a long time. How do I cover race in sports? And the first, my first thing, I know we always talk about race in sports, but the problem uh, in the United States is not race. Uh, the problem is racism. I think we always make that mistake. We say, well, covering race in sports. And well, race isn't a problem. Racism is, is a problem. And uh, I'm a product of uh, black institutions. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, the south side of Chicago. And uh, I was probably 12 years old. You know, Chicago at the time, and probably still now, is one of the most segregated places at that time outside of South Africa. And I was probably 12 years old before I realized that there were more uh, white people than black people because growing up in Chicago, all I saw were black people. And I remember I was in the kitchen once, and I said this to my mother that blacks were the majority. And she said, oh, no, no, Billy, no. And I was like stunned. I said, what? She said, oh, no, you know, you're, Whites are in the majority. I said, well, how come I don't see them? When I go to school, I see just black teachers. When I'm around the neighborhood, also it's black folks. And Chicago was so segregated, going to like the north side was like going to North Korea. And I always joke with Wilbon, uh, Mike Wilbon, who was born not that far from me, but we're about eight years apart. And things are different. Mike became a Chicago Cubs fan. And that was like unheard of. If you were on the south side of Chicago, you were a White Sox fan. And if in the north side was like, the, you know, that was kind of like a white team. Um, so I grew up in Chicago, the south side. And then uh, I went to Morgan State University, uh, which is a historically black college in Baltimore. I played football, went on a football scholarship. And uh, and then, you know, this kind of gets into mentorship. I was at Morgan State University. This kind of gets into how I got into the business. And um, I, I, we always have this debate in our industry about what's more important, who you know or what you know. You know is it who you know or what you know? I'm just curious, unofficial poll. How many of you think who you know is more important? Okay. How many of you think that what you know is more important. You do? Yeah, okay, well, the answer, of course, in typical journalist fashion is they're both important. Who you know is just as important as what you know. Um, but I'm sort of a product of both, the who you know. Um, like I told you, I was uh, at, at Morgan State, and all this is kind of leading into my perspective of covering racism in sports. Because there was never any, you know, that's when we, I was talking to Dave about it. I was like, well, I'm African-American male, and that's always a prism through which I approach things. You know, it was never like, 
let me go right now. The word, uh, the phrase is, uh, how do you cover the intersection of sports and race? And that's one of those cliche phrases. I said, there's no intersection, it's collision. It's the collision of sports and racism. But anyway, so I'm sitting in Morgan, uh, at Morgan, and the only consistent thing I've ever done probably in my life has been writing. I mean, that's pretty much the only thing I've done probably since I was eight was writing. You know, everything else was sort of, you know, the math, stuff like that, just stuff you have to get through to get through. So uh, I'm sitting in, in the class at, at Morgan, and we had one, I was an English major, but we had one journalism class. It was taught by Francis Murphy. Now, the Murphy family, if you Google it, the Murphy family founded the Afro-American newspaper, right? The Afro-American newspaper is one of the oldest black newspapers in the country, and it's very prestigious. And Frances Murphy, at the time, her great-grand, her grandfather founded the Afro. Her grandfather founded the Afro, and she taught this one course in journalism. And uh, I got to be very friendly with her son, Jimmy, and um, so she told me, uh, you know, I had a gift of writing. And so she told me, again, this gets back to who you know. So approaching that senior year where everybody's kind of scrambling, I had no idea, to be honest with you, you could even make a living being a sports writer. I had no clue. You know, kind of like you hear athletes talk about, um, uh, man, I, 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 would, I would play even if it was for free. That's kind of how I felt about sports writing. I love to write love sports, and the idea that you could actually make a living writing about sports, to me, was I was, I had no idea. Uh, so, I'm in, uh, so one day after class, Francis Murphy says, listen, um, if you don't, uh, what are your plans, you know, after graduation? <laughs> and kind of then, I was kind of like, now, nah, after graduation, I, shit, you know, a week is like forever. You <laughs> to talk about, like, after graduation, I, you know, got no clue. I'm kind of like sleepwalking through all this. She said, well, listen, if you don't get drafted by an NFL team and if you decide not to go to graduate school, I want you to bring your, she said, your black butt to the Afro and start working. And that and I remember that. And so as it turns out, I didn't get drafted. Uh, and I decided not to go to grad school. I had no concept of grad school. And so uh, it took me an extra semester to graduate. So gra that graduation was in May. So, but I started working at the Afro-American newspaper in February. So the February before I graduated, I was on the clock. Now that's the thing of who you know, because I remember, and it just kind of hit me a couple years ago, you know, young people were asking me about my career. Well, how did you do this? How, you know, and they were waiting for some tale about, uh, you know, waiting outside the sports editor's office and scuffling and this and that. I realized, no, it really wasn't like that. Uh, Francis Murphy, you know, the, the, the publisher of the Afro-American, told me that if I didn't get drafted and if I didn't go to grad school, I was to report to work at the Afro. And that's how I got the job. So that's who you know. Now, it also introduced me early on to the politics of things. Because again, there was no resume, there was nothing like that. So there are two lessons I learned. So I showed up for work, and there's a little story. You'll, you'll see in the um, Hall of Fame brochure, there's a guy named Sam Lacey, who was inducted into the Hall of Fame here in 2017. Uh, Sam Lacey was probably my first mentor. Uh, you should Google him. Sam Lacey uh, was the longtime sports editor of the Afro-American newspaper. He, he began his career, he died at the age of, 19, uh, of 99. He was 99 years old when he passed. He began working when he was 22, and he wrote his last column at the age of 99 in the hospital. And I don't know, I always kind of think of that. I don't know if that's how I want to go down, but. But, I, but, you know, just the idea that that was his passion, Sam's passion. And Sam became my mentor. Sam is a guy, when you read his bio, uh, 
he was a person, along with a couple other black sports writers, who fought to get Jackie Robinson into Major League Baseball. He petitioned uh, Kenesaw Mountain Landis, the, the uh, commissioner of baseball, and, 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 and he had this fight. And again, this kind of gets back to my conversation with Dave about writing about racism. My whole perspective about covering in this industry was kind of came from Sam a bit because Sam's thing was his whole mission. His whole mission was about fighting for fairness and breaking down barriers. So I had no other, it, it was like as natural as breathing to me that that's what you would do, whether it be sports, I was a jazz critic for a while, you know, it was, my whole career became, how do we make this nation live up to the covenant of this foundation? It's all people are created equal. Um, it's sort of what you do, you should be, it should be about merit. And that was my whole, Thing, probably then and to this date. And, um, you know, Sam, you know, who became the first black writer to be inducted into the baseball writers wing of the Hall of Fame, he had to cover games because they wouldn't let him into the press box. He had to cover games sometimes from the roof of, of the press box, not in the press box. They wouldn't let him in the press box. He had to cover games from the roof of the pre press box. Sometimes they put him behind the dugout. You know, he had to cover games from the dugout. They would not allow him in the press box. And over time, there were some, some of his white colleagues who sometimes would join him on the roof or behind, to, you know, to, to, uh, you know, to show their support. But to me, that was, you know, having a sense of mission early on was what drove me. And even now, um, you know, so I don't want to get too far off track. So Sam was, was, was my mentor, right? So uh, I want to tell you about the politics of who you know versus what you know. So, you know, I know I'm going to start this job in, uh, in, in February. So I went out with one of my mentors. I bought a shirt and a tie and the whole thing to be ready. So I was going to be very impressive. And I was going to show up at eight o'clock in the morning, quitting time. You know, opening day. You know, you're supposed to be there at nine. So I'm going to show them. I'm going to get there at eight o'clock. So I went to the Afro, and they have these three steep flights of steps that you have to climb up to get them. So I got there early. I was very proud of myself. So I climbed up these three flights of steps. You know, think I was going to be the first one in the newsroom. When I got to the top flight of steps, there was Sam. Sam Lacey was there already, and I was kind of stunned. And it turned out he'd been there since 5 in the morning. And so <laughs> that was lesson number one. No matter how hard you think you're working, somebody else is working even more. And, and you kind of extrapolate that. No matter how much think you think you've got, and I've learned this in living in New York, no matter how much you think you've got, somebody's got more. No matter how smart you think you are, somebody else is smart. And at some point, I just said, F it. The best you could do is just do the best you can. Because no matter what you do, somebody's got more. Somebody, you know, and it, 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 I was even looking through this Hall of Fame stuff. If you look through the, the brochure, people have got tremendous credentials. You know, you think you've done something, and you look through the stuff, and sometimes you figure, you know, what am I even doing? You know, like I, I worked, um, uh, so it's first thing I'm going to get to the rest. So that was lesson number one, is walking up the steps, thinking I was early, and Sam Lacey had been there since 5 in the morning. So lesson number one. Lesson number two is the politics of the business. So there was no, I, I, I sat down, and the city editor came and showed up, Miss Oliver. And, you know, she was a city editor. And I didn't go through her. She didn't approve nothing. All she knew is when she showed up, here I am. I'm sitting there. Why? Because of who I knew. Because the, the, the publisher had said, I want you to start in February. And so Miss Oliver came, and she was stunned that I was there. She didn't know I was coming. All she knew was that I was a new reporter, and somebody over her head had put me there. 
and that became a very long running feud, which led me to my, my second point about our industry, is that everybody who does not like you is not necessarily your enemy. Okay, everybody who, who blocks you is not necessarily your enemy because, because Miss Oliver gave, would give me so much grief. She was one of these people, I went to an HBCU, and Miss Oliver was one of the few black folks who had gone to a PWI, a predominantly white institution. She went to Indiana University back in the day, probably like in the 50s. And there was, and probably there's still a divide. She thought really very little of kids who went to HBCUs, you know. And so with me, every mistake I made was not because I was just a young reporter. It was because I went to an HBCU. And so, and I guess part of my thing is because I'm a middle child. My whole thing is, like, I'll show you. I'll show you. And so Miss Oliver, although she was kind of versus me, she became this point of inspiration to me. You know, she didn't, she probably, not that it was her, just her, her intention to inspire me, but that's what she did. She really drove me. That's why I said I was telling a lot of young people that everybody who's against you is not necessarily your enemy. And it really just depends on how you look at things. They could be the greatest source of your inspiration. And she was that for me. So that was the lesson about that. So uh, after Ebony, uh, after, uh, after the Afro, uh, I stayed there for 18 months. And uh, I got a job at the Baltimore uh, at the Baltimore Sun. And at the same time, I was about to leave, and uh, there was a guy there named K.O. Wilson who's advertising. He said, man, listen, if you're gonna leave, if you're gonna leave us, at least go to a black publication. And he said, listen, what, what about Ebony Magazine? And back in the day, Ebony Magazine, for me, was like one of the premier places to write. And my thought was, why would Ebony Magazine want me? And again, this kind of goes into who you know. Uh, little did I know that uh, K.O. Wilson had gone to uh, school, to college, with Herb Nipson, who was executive editor of Ebony Magazine. And he called him, said, listen, I got a kid for you. And uh, they flew me to Chicago. I was going to drive. And I remember her saying, no, 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 son, you don't drive. We're going to fly you there. And so I went to Ebony Magazine. And John Johnson, who's a publisher, uh, again, there's another guy you should know, but John Johnny Johnson was a publisher at Ebony Magazine. And he met me as I got off the elevator. He met me. And he said, oh, this is a young man that we're trying to steal away from the Baltimore Sun. Because I guess he knew that I got that job. And in retrospect, and again, this is about my mission about you know, uh, African Americans and sports and freedom and access, but it's also about the power of black institutions. And, and in retrospect, uh, I look back at that moment with Mr. Johnson, who's the, the publisher of this great, fantastic magazine, the owner of Johnson Publishing Company, meeting me, this 23-year-old black kid, and saying, you know, oh, so this is a guy that we're trying, you know, it was very special. You know, and so um, I ended up working for Ebony, and I must say, it was those four years I spent at Ebony were probably the most enjoyable four years I spent in my career until 2016, where I joined ESPN The Undefeated. I don't know how many of you are familiar with ESPN The Undefeated. Hopefully, after this, you'll, you know. So you'll say, well, you know, um, so, but I, we'll get back to that. So um, I stayed at Ebony for, uh, for four years, four great years, four really spectacular years. It used to be so much fun for me to, uh, you know, I'd be in another city, and I'd go to the, the magazine counter, I'd pick up an Ebony magazine, and I'd look at my name in the masthead, said Bill Roden, you know, associate editor. And it was just so cool to be there with all these, it was an entire black staff. It was an entire black staff. Uh, you know, people like Lerone Bennett, uh, Hans Moskowitz, just a great staff. 
And it was such a nurturing staff. It was kind of like the HBCU experience. And uh, I stayed at Ebony four years. And then, kind of getting back to who you know, uh, now I'm going to get back to the city because, you know, everybody raised their hand and says, who you know is more important than what you know. And who you know is really, really important. But there's going to come a point in your career, no matter who you know, no matter whether your daddy owns the, the thing, there's going to come a point in your career that what you know is going to have to kick in. You're going to have to perform. And probably everybody in this room, I've been there, but it doesn't matter who you know. You can get promoted and pushed along, but there comes a point in the career where you've got to perform. So what you know really becomes critical. Who you know will get you in the door. But what you know ultimately is going to decide how long you stay in this business. So I was at Ebony Magazine, and uh, the Baltimore Sun was going to start this new future section. And of course, the typical thing is, you know, there was, there was, a, uh, there was a, a black reporter at the Sun named Dwayne Wickham, who was a kind of, they would call him a rabble rouser. But, you know, he, he was looking at the, news, the Sun newsroom with no black reporters. And we were about to start this new feature section. And when he complained that there was no, are you going to have any black folks there? And he said, you know, we can't find anybody. And he said, you can't find anybody. There's Bill Roden, who's a feature writer for Ebony Magazine, who played football at Morgan, went to Morgan. And, you know, you got to put him on your radar. So I got a call from uh, the editor, Steve Parks, that flew me in for an interview. And uh, I was an outstanding feature writer. And I was, you know, I spent my career, a uh, young career in Baltimore. So I was hired. Uh, so I came back to the Baltimore Sun as a feature writer and a jazz critic. That's one thing I really wanted to do. I wanted to write about, about the music, about jazz. And so, um, again, but it was very interesting. I, I, I was about to, so I, I finally decided to take the job because, frankly, I thought in the thought process that, you know, here is my, my entire career had been, you know, at Morgan, black, you know, HBCU, grew up in the south side of Chicago, was black, you know, Afro's black. I said, I need to kind of learn the language of white folks. I need to kind of start becoming fluent in white people, you know, because I spent my career black. So the Baltimore Sun, so I decided I was going to go to the Baltimore Sun. I remember Mr. Johnson summoned me to his, his 11th floor office. And I guess I was sophisticated to realize that this was my opportunity to get more money. Because he was asking me, why are you going to Baltimore? I remember he said, some of the things you remember like it was yesterday. He said, maybe you know where the fun is in Baltimore, but I don't. Why are you going to Baltimore? And then he told me, he said, you know, you know what's going to happen. You're going to go there, and whenever there's a great assignment, because I was somewhat of the golden child at Ebony Magazine, and he told me, you know this is going to be the last time you're going to be the golden boy. Because when you go to this white publication, whenever there's a great assignment, they're going to give it to the white boy. And that's, that's, I'm just saying that's what he said. He said, you know, when there's a great, when there's a great thing, they're going to give it to the white boy. When there's a great assignment, they're going to give it to the white guy. You know? And although... I've gone on to have what I estimate has been a pretty outstanding career, very satisfying career. Essentially, I realized that what Mr. Johnson was saying was correct. It was, he was dead on. He was correct. Is that this would be my last time with this black organization that I was going to be the golden boy. Because these white institutions, you know, that's what they, they, they didn't need me to be the golden child. They had enough white folks to be the golden child. So I would, so, and I, I really learned this at the Baltimore Sun, when it was fine. You know, I, they're good friends, you know, uh, great colleagues. But again, it was a whole difference of walking into Ebony Magazine or going into the Afro and they're being surrounded by black folks and walking into the Baltimore Sun and like I was the only black person there, maybe one or two. And I don't think a lot of people really fully understand what that's like. Uh, so I went, to the, I went to the Baltimore Sun. And I want to get back to that point. But I went to the Baltimore Sun, and it was fine. 
you know, I start writing the jazz column, uh, and I would do with jazz what I would later do with sports. I would just use jazz to to examine racism, how you had all these great black musicians creating all this music, but yet the people who benefited from it, the people who analyzed it, were white. The producers, the club owners. And it was the same, it would almost mirror what I would find in sports later on. While you had all these black athletes running and jumping, the people who controlled it, the people that made money from it, was this white foundation. And that's where I became really fascinated with. So the jazz columns I began to write were more about power and control. So I stayed at the Sun for four years, and uh, a friend of mine who had worked with Ebony was at the, uh, at the New York Times. And I remember he called me and he said, listen, Bill, there's this opening for the at the Week in Review, you know, and it's funny, I guess when I think back on it, that was always one of my goals, is to work at the New York Times. Because everywhere I was, whether it was at Ebony or the Baltimore Sun, people would always bring in the New York Times. If you wanted to get an idea uh, greenlit, all you had to do was say, well, it was in the New York Times. And this was consistently. So I said, Shit, you know, man, maybe this is the place, I, you know, maybe this is where I should be. But you know, again, working for a place like the New York Times, again, coming from public school in Chicago, and it was just like a pipe dream. So Carlisle called and said, listen, there's an opening in the Week in Review for an editor in the Week in Review. And, you know, I'm not an editor, I'm a writer. But the idea was that, well, let me just go up there and do my two-week tryout and get on, the, get, on the, get on the train. Maybe I'll start on the caboose and I'll work my way up to the engine. And so um, uh, I left the Sun, went to, uh, uh, you know, went to the Times, and I remember it was just so intimidating. And I remember talking to my father, and I said, man, what do you, you know, it's like New York. And uh, he said, well, why don't you go try it? You may like it. And so I went to New York, went to the Times, tried out, it was like a, a two-week tryout. And, it was one of those times where everything just kind of aligned. Everything was aligned. Uh, so I got the job, and uh, I stayed there for 34 years. Um, 27 of those years uh, were spent uh, as a columnist. And it was probably one of the most fascinating times of my career. Uh, 27, year, you know, 27 years, 34 years in all, 27 years writing opinion. And most of the opinion uh, was basically spent writing about racism, uh, being excluded. And, you know, it wasn't like that's something I wanted to do. You know, in, in other words, it wasn't like I said, you know, let me make now they've got beat. You know, let me make race a beat. It wasn't like that. You know, hell, I would have loved to just go to the press box and just be like a lot of my colleagues, you know, eat popcorn, drink, you know, bullshit, you know, watch the game and, and, and there's no, you know, but there were so many things that bothered me, kind of like it bothered Sam Lacey to walk in press boxes, as I even do now, even at, at this day in 2021 there'll still be press boxes I'll go to with I may still be the only African-American there in 2021. You know, uh, there've been more women, but that sense of mission, and I guess this gets back to when Dave said talk about how the undefeated covers racism. It's, well, you know what, it, it was just kind of like breathing. It's just a sense of something being wrong and having racism being reflected through sports. And so um, I said that the 27 years I spent at the Times were fascinating. I mean, the 34 years I spent at the Times were fascinating. 
But these four years that I spent at the undefeated and those four years I spent at Ebony were probably the most enjoyable. And this is what I meant by that. I was just watching, I was, I was reading a study. Uh, I was trying to find it before I came up here. But it was a study, somebody said that the people who are most in favor of going back to the office are usually white males. And the people who aren't crazy about going back to the office are quote unquote people of color. And there were reasons for it. And one of the things they were saying is that, and, and, and it's kind of I alluded to before, is that I guess I didn't realize, again, I had a, a, an outstanding career at the time. I really, it was a unique journalism experience. But there was something about going into the office and this whole idea of walking through these newsrooms and it's, it's like floor after floor of non-black folks, mostly white folks. And unless you go through, you really don't know what this, I guess the closest thing if you're a woman and you're constantly going into rooms where there are no women, you know, it's kind of like that. And I think if you're a male, in particular a white male, you have no idea of what that's like. And for all the years I was writing columns at the Times and writing about race, I remember as much as I respect the editing process at the time, everything you wrote was basically edited by about four people. You know, it was, it was excruciating and it was good. But, uh, and, and, and a lot of the editors were really good friends of mine. But a lot of the questions were like, well, Bill, are you sure you can say this? I mean, you know, how are, how are like our white readers of Connecticut? What are they going to think? You know, and although I wouldn't really edit myself, you're kind of aware of that kind of stuff, you know, uh, and you're and you're somehow you feel like you're in this silo when you're about to attack something, you know, every hiring cycle, the lack of black coaches, uh, stereotypes. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of the stuff we grapple with, racism, is reflected in these sports codes. And I, I became aware of that. But again, it's, 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 it's a mission. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like a blessing and a curse, you know, it, it, that you cannot not do it. You cannot not discuss tough issues. You just can't. I wish I could. You know, like I said, I wish I could just go to a compressed box and go to these things and just say, and just ignore it, you know. And, and there are some generations of maybe some younger black reporters, you know, and I said, no, man, you, you know, that you, you cannot do this. There are too many people who work too hard to knock down these barriers for you to just ignore this stuff. And I think it's the same thing for young women getting into the business. You know, there's a there's a, a, a burden that you carry, and it really shouldn't be a burden. It should really be a, a joy of fighting like that, as, as Sam Ray said, fighting for fairness. Um, and I know my source of motivation, uh, and I don't know how many of you have done this. I, I teach a, a course at Arizona State, uh, a course in commentary in the digital age. And one of the first assignments I give the students is to go find the oldest person in your family, the oldest living person in your family, and to interview them, and to talk to them. And in the course of that conversation, find out what are the commonality, commonalities that link you and them? What are the things that you've gone through? What are the things that they went through? And invariably, people are knocked out when they hear what some of their ancestors had to go through to get to this point. And it's very sobering. And to me, that's my source of strength, is whenever, whatever you think you're going through, I'll talk to like a grandfather while he's still living. And you just talk to, talk to a, an older black person in their 80s and 90s about what was it like growing up in the South, in Chicago, you know, where things that I take for granted, you know, uh, you stand in line and you expect to get waited on. They stand in line and never get waited on. Uh, 
you know, walk down the side of the street and you see a white person coming, you have to move to the other side. I mean, just, just things that we all take for granted. And I'm like, damn, what was, what was even an hour like for them? You know, so um, when it comes to, you know, an undefeated, oh, so, okay, so my point is, so going to the undefeated, I went to the undefeated in 2016. I left the Times uh, 2016 and began working at the undefeated, this new website. And two things that were going to happen. A, I would start writing, uh, John X is here, but there's a guy named, it's an all, all black staff. In fact, three black women now run it, the executive editor, the managing editor, and the video editor. And I was thinking about this the other day. You know, John X Miller, who's, the, who's my editor, who I deal with, I've known John X for almost 30 years. And it's so funny that the level of discourse when you talk about things like racism, there's certain things you don't even have to explain. You just start at a certain level. We don't have to, there's certain assumptions that you don't even have to make. And it's so easy. And I'm like, damn, you know, I guess I didn't realize how for, for 27 of the 34 years I was writing a column at the time, there was this, old, this fucking pressure that I felt that I didn't know I was feeling. You know, it was just this thing that was there. And you go to this place, the undefeated, and although it is part of ESPN and Disney and all that, they said, okay, you guys have a long runway to deal with racism and race and that kind of stuff. Um, so that's why it's been so liberating, uh, you know, per the, uh, uh, the discussion, you know, the topic of this discussion, an undefeated way of covering racism. And an undefeated way is basically an unchained way. Um, and my only question, I guess, to a lot of the younger reports, younger people, is that how do you see racism in, in your generation? Um, the, the second thing that the undefeated did is that they created a fellowship in my name. It's a fellowship called the Roden, well, Roden, the Roden Fellows. And the Roden Fellows is an uh, annual fellowship we award to six young students at six HBCUs. Because again, I went to an HBCU, and one of my missions was, how do I put more young African Americans in the pipeline? Okay, and, and I, I know, you know, we're in this thing of people of color. I don't know what the fuck that means, to say people of color. Because I know there are a lot of people of color, but all the people of color, we don't have the same things in common at all. I have to be very specific. I said, okay, I get it. But I went to an HBCU. I hate going to press boxes, newsroom, where they're like, no black folks. How do we put black folks in the pipeline? So we created the uh, Roden Fellows. And every year, we select six kids from six HBCUs. And they get a paid fellowship. And they write for the undefeated. They work with ESPN. They work with a whole Disney thing. And hopefully at the very end of their year on fellowship, the idea is for them to be either go back into Disney or go to grad school or work in the industry. So we've just named our fifth class. That's not a lot of people, but it's 30 people. It's 30 people that you put in the pipeline and hopefully 30 leaders that you put in the pipeline. That's sort of like planting a seed or it's like a ripple on a pond. And it, it, it expands. Um, so that's that. Uh, I want to have, a, you know, if there are any questions or answers. The second thing, I guess, I want to talk about activism. I think that one of the most exciting things that's happened in COVID has all of a sudden been this. Uh, and I also wrote a book. I wrote a book called Forty Million Dollar Slaves: uh, The Rise and Fall and Redemption of Black Athletes. And it examines a lot of stuff I'm talking about here, which is this power dynamic that really has not 
changed. And I really thought that um, the whole, you know, with the murder of George Floyd, uh, the killing in Georgia, uh, other un underreported acts of police violence, and it was very exciting to see how young black athletes became activated. I think a lot had to do with the last administration, uh, which, became, you know, things were very polarized. And uh, I made a note that I think it really began when POTUS 45 was in Huntsville, Alabama. And this is at the height of the, uh, uh, with Colin Kaepernick kneeling, a, a lot of athletes were kneeling. All that, and he was in Huntsville, Alabama, and he said, I, I, "I'm not quoting him directly, but remember, he said, I would, you know, fire those sons of bitches, you know. Now, this remember, this is in Huntsville, Alabama. This probably predominantly white crowd. I'm sure there's probably like one black person there, about one black person, you know. <laughs> but you know, um, Huntsville, Alabama. He's talking fire. Everybody's going nuts, and I said, you know what? On Saturday, half those people are going to be uh, at the Auburn game. The other half are going to be at the Alabama game cheering for these teams with all these black, young black kids. You know, that's sort of the dilemma of racism, you know, racism in America. But I thought that was sort of the beginning because a lot of athletes were really incensed and infuriated by that. And for, from that window until probably – last year, you know, during the, the bubble, I thought that, man, we'd really seen something. The WNBA really stepped up. You know, those women really helped turn the election, the Senate election in, in, in Georgia. You know, athletes seemed to be really, we seemed to really be on the verge of something. Uh, if you looked at the bubble, you know, in the NBA, you know, there was all kind of signage in all the arenas. Black Lives Matter, you know, they, they let the guys put stuff on their jersey. You know, uh, that even the NFL, you know, Roger Goodell said, you know, black athletes are an imminent importance to the NFL. Not exact word, but sentiment. I was like, damn, <laughs> really? You know, um, so I thought that we are really on the verge of something, of really some type of activism. And then just recently, you know, probably at the beginning of this year, I'm thinking, man, where is all this stuff gone? You know, do we actually, do these leagues, ha have they lost their memory? And I'm looking at the signage in the NFL stadiums. I've seen no Black Lives Matter, nothing. You know, same thing in the NBA arenas. Like, no Black Lives Matter, nothing. It's almost as if, okay, that was a fad, we got over it. And it's funny, what the NFL has done is you see this campaign now about cleats, you know, they have all the athletes could do something with their cleats, put message on their cleats. I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, we've kind of substituted, you know, these strong black glass stuff. Okay, listen, guys, let's kind of soften this up a little bit. Everybody do your own thing, you know. And these are all notable charities, no problem, but nothing as in your face as when a lot of these athletes were putting, like, Black Lives Matter and this and that because – Clearly, the owners, most of whom are Republican, are saying this probably is not good for business. This is not good for business. And so we've got this soft version of the cleats and the nice, nice messages for cleats, but it's not in your face. It's not those messages that, no, our issue in this country is racism. And here we have young, mostly African-American men who are affected by this imprisonment, you know, incarceration, economic uh, inequity, all these things that washed up these last two abominable years of, of, of COVID, all this stuff come, came flushing out, and our families were affected. And if we're affected, we're going to make you be affected. And that put so much pressure on owners because they were in a very difficult position. They said, yes, we are billionaires, but our business, our business, our labor, uh, these mostly young black kids. That's what distinguishes us from most industries, is that our labor, our, our, our labor is black muscle. And when this black muscle starts telling us, listen, we've got issues. Okay, it's okay for you, Roger Goodell, 
to say that uh, black folks are important, but how much business does the NFL do with black vendors? How many black folks do you have in your executive suite? Let's talk about stuff. how many black folks do you have in your boards of directors and your other businesses? And they've started to ask those questions, but now it seems to have kind of gone away. So I guess in wrapping this stuff up, I guess those are the kinds of questions, those are the kinds of questions that I want young reporters to pursue. You know, but it seems like we've kind of gotten back to sports as a diversion. We've kind of embraced the diversion of sports rather than the economics of sports. Who's hired to tell these stories? So um, it's kind of my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, but if anybody has any, any responses or questions or critiques, uh, we, could, we could duke and go from there. Well, I knew the, I knew the white and I knew male. I didn't know Alabama. No, it is remarkable. It, it, it actually, and they is it's the undefeated. It's ESPN. It's Disney. I mean, they're the ones who have have really embraced not only the fellowship, but they've embraced the whole idea of HBCU, you know, really putting a lot of stuff behind HBCU. I'm not, I'm not nuts about uh, paying athletes. Uh, you know, I, I really, this name, image, and likeness, I like the idea of, of if you're shrewd enough to capitalize on it, fine. But the idea of a straight payment, uh, uh, I'm not nuts about because I still think education is really, really important. Getting that degree is really, really important. Uh, what I wouldn't mind happening is if um, if a trust was set up for athletes. In other words, you know, we're coming up to the bowl season now. And if your school goes to a bowl game, I'd like to set up uh, some type of economic structure, sharing, revenue sharing, basically, that all the athletes, if you're in Alabama or Auburn or whatever school you're going to, and you get like a $10 million payout, the school does, I'd like to see some sort of formula where the athletes get a share of that, uh, but it, it goes into a trust fund. And when you're, let me quibble about this, when, when, it, when your four years are up or eligibility is up, whatever is in your bank account, whatever you built up, if you've gone, you're right, it, it's still unfair. Because if you go to a place like Alabama, you're gonna have four years worth of money in your trust fund. You know, but whatever, wherever you go, I like, I'm, I'm more in favor of that than uh, just kind of straight up payment because um, uh, uh, I, A, I don't know how you do it because the volleyball players kind of have to get paid too, something. Uh, so yeah, so I'm not nuts about straight up payment, but I would like to see some type of a compensation system based on how much economically you help your, your team. Yes, sir.
kind of tough to imagine. Um, that, I mean, that's hard. I mean, I, I think about this now and then. Well, what would happen if I were like a white male? And then that lasts for like a second, and I have no idea. But I think that uh, you just have to follow the truth where it leads. In other words, you just follow the truth where it leads. If something fascinates you, something of interest, then that's what you investigate. I think that you can't put yourself in a box, like I'm a white male, or I'm this, or I'm that. Uh, you know, and so it means I can't do this. I just think as a reporter, you kind of let reporting take over. What, what are the facts? What's the subject? How do I go about reporting it? You know, that, you know I, I would not, not self-check yourself and say, well, I can't do this because I'm, I'm that. You know, I would just, again, my thing is sort of just let, you know, follow the truth uh, where it leads and then just report, report, report.